Good evening, friends and family. On behalf of our family, we want to just thank all of you for being with us through this entire experience, but most of all, being here tonight with us. At this time, we would like for you all to please stand so that we can say a prayer. Thank you, Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to be here tonight. We're thankful, God, that we are able to gather together in this celebration of life for Rachel. Father, right now I ask that your spirit would be in this place, Lord. Comfort all of us, Lord, as we mourn. Father, I ask that you would use all of us to comfort each other. Heavenly Father, have your way in this service. I pray, pray peace in the hearts of everyone who is here. I pray that everything that we do and we say honors you. I pray that your blessed Holy Spirit would be felt in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would remain standing. <laughs> God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. You may be seated. Good evening. Thank you all again for being here as we celebrate the precious life of Rachel Pagan. Uh, my name is Eric. Uh, I'm Rachel's brother-in-law, Jesenia's husband. And I've known Rachel for almost 30 years. Um, I know she'd be glad to see you all here. If you're here, it's because she loved you all and because you experienced that love with the warmness, kindness, and generosity that only Rachel could give. Next, I'm going to call up my oldest daughter, Mariah, to read the eulogy. Rachel Pecan served in many ways and made a profound impact on those around her. She first served in the U.S. Navy for four years. She then served as a registered nurse for 25 plus years. She was also, also deeply engaged in service and fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous for 27 plus years, connecting, supporting, serving, and assisting others in maintaining their paths to recovery. Rachel was born in Brooklyn, New York on September 7, 1956. She attended Prince George's Community College for Nursing School and graduated in 1984. She also attended University of North Carolina Asheville and received her BA degree in Religious Studies. She then attended Piedmont University where she received her master's degree in Biblical Studies. Rachel loved to read the Bible for its beautiful prose and spiritual meanings and wanted to share that with others. She became a clergywoman and officiated weddings. Rachel is survived by her three children, Dylan Jackson, Talia Jackson, Asia Jackson, and her grandchildren, Taj Jackson and Ty Jackson. She is also survived by her mothers, Eliza Santiago and Yolanda Pagan. She is preceded in death by her father, Eddie Pagan, and her brother, Gary Pagan. Next, we'll be uh, displaying a, uh, I'm sorry, a slideshow honoring and celebrating Rachel's life.
Did you ever know that you were patient, thoughtful? Did you ever know that you were everything that I need? Everyone needs to have that someone to listen, laugh with, company. Did you know?
across the sky That's what you did for my heart Right from the start Did you know that you were this to me? Did you know that you were this to me? Did you ever know just a hero You have always been there And always will be Since the moment we met Your love just can't forget Did you know that you were this to me? Did you know Beautiful, what a beautiful woman and a beautiful family. Thank you to all who shared their uh, photographs to make that video tribute a possibility. Um, now we'll welcome some of the family members up uh, to present a musical tribute for Rachel. As you can tell, we didn't practice this part. <laughs> We're ready when you are. We also invite you guys to sing along. Your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am faithful Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God of your voice you have led me through the fire in the darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness
Amen. Rachel loved music, and I know she rejoiced over that, seeing her family come together to honor with her with that song. It's truly a blessing. I'd like to now invite Veronica to lead us in a prayer. Rachel was a lot to many, but she was also my sponsor and my closest friend in Asheville. I want to thank her beautiful family for sharing her with us. She truly was a beacon of light, and I want to read a prayer by an author that Rachel loved, Marianne Williamson. Dear God, take the soul and spirit of this dear departed one into the sweetest, sweetest corner of your mind, the most tender place in your heart, that she and I might be comforted. For now she is gone, and I pray, dear God, for the strength to remember she has not gone far, for she is with you and shall remain so forever. She remains with me, for we are all in you together. The cord that binds us one to another cannot be cut, surely not by death. For you, dear God, have brought us together, and we remain in eternal connection. There is no power greater than you. Death is not your master nor mine. These things I believe and ask my heart to register. I surrender to you my grief. I surrender to you my pain. Please take care of your servant, my dear one who has passed, and please, dear Lord, Take care of me. Amen. And now a uh, passage of scripture that uh, Rachel treasured. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 through 14. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Talia, I invite you for a personal tribute. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel's oldest daughter, Talia. Um, I just wanna say that my mom, she taught me how to love, period. She, she's one of my favorite people. She taught me how to be affectionate. She taught me joy and enthusiasm. She was my hero. <clears throat> Her path to recovery is what also saved mine. She introduced me to lots of spiritual texts and I think our spiritual paths were aligned. You know the popular saying, what would Jesus do? If my mom had a church, it would say all are welcome and to come as you are, because that's what Jesus would do. She would feed everyone like Jesus. Everyone. But instead of fish, it would be empanadas. She would have church picnics, play salsa music, BB and CC Winans, Kirk Franklin, 
My mom walked the walk. She didn't just talk. She lived by what would Jesus do. She was a minister. She got her graduate degree in biblical studies. She loved the Bible. She was very smart. There's so many people who say that you get your intelligence from your mother. I got mine. We loved the same things. She loved to read. She loved to write. She wrote a short story that was published. Um, she served a lot. And I just wanted to acknowledge all of her accomplishments because that's what she wanted to do. And I want to continue to serve like she did. So that's it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Asia. I'm her youngest daughter, her youngest child. My mom was my favorite person on earth, as I know she was to many people. She was my rock, my everything. I talked to her every day just to say, what you doing? <laughs> or my mommy, my mommy. And it didn't matter how she felt, whether she was tired or had talked to her 92 sponsees all day. <laughs> she always made time for us. That's one thing I've always appreciated about her. She always showed up. Her, her job as a single mother was strenuous, but her number one priority was her babies. One thing I always remember is her forcing me to learn how to salsa in the third grade. She would make me stand up and dance. At the time, I'd be like, I just want to watch TV, but I'm grateful she instilled that part of our culture in me. And I will be sure to pass Abuelita's lessons on to my own children. I'm grateful she got to witness all of my Navy accomplishments in person. She was at every single one of them. Got to witness my engagement to the love of my life. And I'll be sure to dedicate a salsa dance to her and save a seat for her at my wedding. I love you, mamita. And get ready for all the bochinche I have ready for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Talia and Asia. For those of us who know them, know how much of their mother they carry in their hearts. You're precious and we love you. Yolanda. everybody. I'm Leah. I'm one of Rachel's sisters as well. And um, my mom, our mom Yolanda, wrote this for her, but it's too difficult for her to read it, so I said that I would read it for her. Rachel, a name that means a woman with special strength, an honest person, a person who is grounded, genuine, and authentic, my daughter Rachel. From the day I met Rachel, it was love at first sight. I instantly fell in love with not only who she was, but I fell in love with a young lady who displayed strength and resilience. Rachel was a person who could stare life right in the face, and I always respected her and admired her willingness to always defend the ones that she loved. Rachel was a bright light in my life. Rachel understood that we can only live in the present moment and she was determined not to give up without a fight. Transitioning will always be a process that wreaks emotional havoc in our lives, but I will hold on to our happy memories about all the good times we shared. I was both honored and blessed to have you as a daughter. The time we spent together can never be described as boring or uneventful. I will hold these fond memories forever. Thinking of you no longer being here will always cause me pain. 
but you are forever in my heart until we meet again. I love you, Mama Yolanda. Renee Yvette. Good evening, family. I'm a recovering addict. My name's Renee. And um, what I planned to do was to do a recovery eulogy for Rachel. Um, but first, I need to share with you that uh, for those of you who understand this, just for today said, the friendship of other members of the fellowship is a life-sustaining gift. I will reach out for the friendship that's offered in NA and accepted. Okay, so um, I want to share some of the NA highlights of Rachel P's life. NA stands for Narcotics Anonymous, if you don't know. So Rachel and I met 28 years ago in Miami, Florida, outside of an NA meeting in North Dade area. We called it Little Chairs because it was held in a nursery and we physically sat in little chairs. <laughs> I walked out of the meeting um, so I could smoke a cigarette and this woman followed behind me and I said, that speaker sucked. And she said, it's not about the messenger, it's about the message. And I looked at her like, who are you? <laughs> and we became friends, we were friends ever since that night. We exchanged phone numbers, and it's been 28 years. So Rachel got involved with the 12 steps and began teaching what she learned as she shared with friends, spoke in meetings, and worked with sponsees. We were joined at the hips in this process we call recovery. If you saw one, the other was not far behind. We were known as Lucy and Ethel, Oscar and Felix, Thelma and Louise, and if you're too young to know what the, who those people are, we were joined at the hips. <laughs> Ray, as I called her, was my ace, boon, coon, confidant, sister, and BFF. One time we were having lunch and someone shared about a person who was in our program and who was clean and they had been arrested. And she looked at me and said, girl, if you ever get arrested, don't call me. <laughs> I'm not bailing you out. I said, well, I won't be able to call you because you'll be sitting right next to me. <laughs> and she looked up at me and said, yeah, you're right. As we, as, as we got involved in service, Rachel created the New Year's Eve formal dinner dance fundraiser for the Gold Coast area in Florida, which was a tradition for many years. She moved out of state for a few years, and when she returned, she was a member of the convention committee for Mid-Coast area in Boca Raton, Florida. She brought speakers from all over the country to share at their convention. 13 years ago, she moved to Asheville and began spreading her love of the NA program with the women in the area and has a family tree of over 200 plus of recovering women. Her home group was Steps at Noon, which meets every Tuesday at noon. Besides sponsoring, she joined the Shit Lots, which is spiritually high in the land of the sky area convention committee and served in various positions for many years. Ray loved all of us passionately and took care of us with her nurturing spirit and great food, as Talia mentioned. She had a successful empanada business with her special sauce, mild or hot, and she was an avid music lover who loved to dance. In NA, we shared many years of going to meetings, conventions, banquets, as you saw in some of the pictures, fundraisers, spiritual retreats, cabin meetings, and vacations. Oh, man. With more fun than I have time to speak about. Many laughs, tears, and great memories. My daughter said we have our own language. We called each other Gra instead of girl. What's up, Gra? That's how I refer to her. I was so blessed to be a part of her beautiful life and grateful to share the joy, pain, happiness, and recovery. 
Ray was a proud, meeting-making, step-working woman of Narcotics Anonymous with 27 plus years clean, who lived this program every day. She was my shero, and she always had my back, and I had hers. Some of her favorite sayings from the program of NA is, lost dreams awakened and new possibilities arise when we stay clean. Another one was, if you, if you are new, keep coming back, because it works if you work it. And I just want to read something for those of you who I know your hearts are full and um, you're a little sad. So from our It Works How and Why Green and Gold book on page 33, whenever her and I were in pain, we would say, go to page 33, grab, because here's your answer. Recovery doesn't exempt us from having to live through painful situations. At some point in our lives, we may have to mourn the death of a loved one or deal with the end of a relationship. When such things happen to us, we hurt, and no amount of spiritual awareness will take, a, take our pain away. We do find, however, that the caring presence of a loving power greater than ourselves will help us get through our pain clean. We may find that we are able to feel our higher power's presence in the group and our friends or in talking to our sponsor. By tapping into that power, we begin to trust and rely on it. We can cease questioning why painful things happen and trust that walking through the difficult times in our lives can strengthen our recovery. We can grow in spite of our pain or perhaps in response to it. And lastly, <clears throat> Um, I just want to say, um, you can join in with me if you know this. Um, many of us have said, take my will in my life, guide me in my recovery, and show me how to live. Thank you. Rest in paradise, Greer, until we meet again. Te quiero mucho, Renee. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Now, Tracy Higgs. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, I'm, I'm Trey. I'm uh, Renee's, Renee's daughter. Uh, excuse my voice a little bit. Um, I'm just going to read a, a passage and just share some thoughts. Um, uh, I'm reading from The Alchemist, I'm sorry, by Paolo Coelho. Coelho. Um, <clears throat> Didn't you spend enough time looking at me yesterday? Some, somewhere you are holding the person I love, the boy said. So when I, look over, when I look out over your sands, I am also looking at her. I want to return to her, and I need your help so that I can turn myself into the wind. What is love, the desert asked. Love is the falcon's flight over your sands, because for him, you are a green field from which ha he always returns with gain. He knows your rocks, your dunes, and your mountains, and you are generous to him. The falcon's beak carries bits of me, myself, the desert said. For years, I care for his game, feeding it with the little water that I have, and then I show him where the game is, and one day, as I enjoy the fact that his game thrives on my surface, the falcon dives out, dives out of the sky and takes away what I've created. But that's why you created the game in the first place, the boy answered, to nourish the falcon, and the falcon then nourishes man, and eventually man will nourish your sands where the game will once again flourish. That's how the world goes. So is that what love is? Yes, that's what love is. It's what makes the game become the falcon, the falcon become the man, and man in his turn, the desert. It's what turns lead into gold and makes the gold rerun to the earth. I don't understand what you're talking about, the desert said. Okay, so I read that um, because uh, Titi Ray gave me this book when I graduated college. Um, and, um, uh, sorry. Um, so if you're looking for clarity on what I just read, um, I'm still looking to. Because when I, when I read it, I finally got around to reading it, I, I texted Titi Ray and I was like, 
I'm a little late. I graduated a few years ago, but what is this book about? Like, what is this book about? What are, what are we reading, you know? And she called me because we were texting too much, and she called me right away. Um, I said, uh, it just didn't hit. You know, I had more questions than answers. And um, as Talia said, she was really smart. Um, so we talked, and some of it I still didn't get. <laughs> um, but just the comfort and the, the sense of immense, like, let's break this down, let's talk, or what did you think about it, was really, just really great, um, really great. Um, the phrase, it takes a village, um, really ap applies to the gratitude I have for Didi Ray. Um, you know, my mom just shared, they've known each other for 28 years. I'm 30, so, you know, I've, I've known her a very long time. I'm um, grateful that Asia and Talia let, you know, me share their mom. Um, and so many of my earliest memories are with them, like really, um, in Miami with um, Shaba and Tai Chow. <laughs> um, thank you, I'm sorry, I left my handkerchief, thank you. Um, so many of the times I felt less alone and more warm and loved and involved, involved them. Long car rides, long hugs, and long laughs. I'm gonna miss overhearing, um, sorry. I'm gonna miss overhearing uh, and trying to decipher my mom and Titi Ray's secret, cackle-filled, uh, sorry, Virgo, Thelma and Louise, gurgle laughed, super double-coated conversations and giving Asia the, what they talking about? <laughs> Look, <laughs> I'll miss you forever, Titi Ray, I love you. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, Veronica. I'm back, sorry. Um, even in Rachel's final days, she still kept her sense of humor and the thing that made for her. When I got to say goodbye to her, I tried to compose myself and I told her, you know, without you, I never would be the person I am today. And I, and I told her, you know, um, I said, you, you know, you've changed my life. And she opened her eyes and she looked at me and she said, you're killing me, Veronica. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> I just started laughing because, you know, that's, that's her. <laughs> and I just want to say that um, to my friend, I know you aren't really gone. I will think of you every morning that I pray. I will think of you every convention that I attend. I will think of you every time I begin a new TV series. <laughs> I will miss the way you dance in your kitchen. I will miss the way you say my name. I will miss the way you say mama. I will miss your cooking. I promise to compare every empanada I eat to your recipe. <laughs> <laughs> but most importantly, I will miss your light, your openness, your compassion, and your unconditional love you gave me. You changed my life, and I love you, mama. Thank you, Veronica. Lindsay? Hey, y'all, I'm Lindsay. Should I say I'm an addict? Is that, are we doing that? Hey, y'all, I'm Lindsay, I'm an addict. Thank you to everyone who is here today to honor the impact Rachel made in your life. What you don't already know about her, you are sure to learn today and see in times to come as her spirit remains within and around us. I haven't quite found comfort that she is gone, but rather thanks that she was ours. Our mother, our daughter, our sister, our friend, our pillar of strength and guidance. 
Rachel had a unique part to play in healing our world, and oh, how she did. She believed in us, carried us, and comforted our souls in just her presence alone. Only Rachel could fill such a deep void that so many of us came to her with. She truly, in, truly embodied grace, dignity, and compassion by accepting others for who they are and where they are. The unconditional love and spiritual preparedness she gifted us makes life less, life's lessons a little softer and more bearable. As my sister shared with her, in her last days, Rachel was pure magic. The posture in her heart, the sound of her laugh, the wise words she had or intentional space she held for us cannot be duplicated. As most of you know, Rachel was strong in her faith and was quick to share readings or teachings she was moved by. She adored Marianne Williamson, and just as she would expect, I'd like to share a quote from her that I feel captures Rachel's impact. Love is the essential reality in our purpose on earth. To be consciously aware of it, to experience love in ourselves and others, is the meaning of life. Meaning does not lie in things, meaning lies in us. As her maker granted her transition to the next realm, I am comforted knowing she remains watching, protecting, guiding, and challenging me until we meet again. Seven years ago, you became my lifeline and asked me how free I wanted to be. Today, I envision you with the divine and total freedom from any suffering. Look over Pooch, the boys, and me. Know that we will see you again. I love you, Mama. My name's Katie. I'm an addict. Like many of you, Rachel was much more to me than ever intended. She was my sponsor, my mentor, my educator, my cheerleader, my sounding board, and my best friend. She answered calls, millions of questions, dried many tears, and held monumental space. And she did all of this with joy in her heart and enthusiasm in her tone. Though I share in the same sadness that now binds us all, I carry a great sense of pride to have truly known her. So as we celebrate who she is, I encourage you, as was told to me, to watch, to watch for her all around you. But most of all, listen for her in your heart. Stand up for others when no one else is watching. Carry your truth with confidence and intelligence and love one another with unfettered compassion the way she loved each one of us. I leave you with a poem from A.K. Rosewell. Should you go first and I remain to walk the road alone, I'll live in memory's garden, dear, with happy days we've known. In spring, I'll wait for roses red, wind fades the lilac blue. <clears throat> In early fall, when brown leaves call, I'll catch a glimpse of you. Should you go first and I remain for battles to be fought, each thing you've touched along the way will be a hallowed spot. I'll hear your voice, I'll see your smile, though blindly I may grope. The memory of your healing hand will, bully me, will buoy me with hope. Should you go first and I remain to finish with the scroll, no lengthening shadows shall creep in to make this life seem droll. We've known so much of happiness, we've had our cup of joy, and memory is one gift of God that death cannot destroy. Should you go first and I remain, one thing I'd have you do, walk slowly, walk slowly down that long, lone path for soon I'll follow you. I want to know each step you take that I may walk the same. For someday down that lonely road, you'll hear me call your name. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Luca Santiago. I'm 
an addict. My name is Marjan, and I'm standing in for Luca. Um, and this poem is for Rachel from Sophia. Death is nothing at all. It does not count. I have only slipped away into the next room. Nothing has happened. Everything remains exactly as it was. I am I, and you are you. And the old life that we lived so fondly together is untouched, unchanged. Whatever we were to each other, that we are still. Call me by the old familiar name. Speak of me in the easy way which you always used. Put no difference in your tone. Where no forced air of Solomon, oh, I can't even pronounce the word, or sorrow. Laugh as we always laughed at the little jokes that we enjoyed together. Play, smile, think of me, pray for me. Let my name be ever the household word that it always was. Let it be spoken without an effort, without the ghost of a shadow upon it. Life means all that it ever meant. It is the same as it ever was. There is absolute and unbroken continuity. What is this death but a negligible accident? Why should I be out of mind because I am out of sight? I am but waiting for you, for an interval somewhere very near, just around the corner. All is well, nothing is hurt, nothing is lost. One brief moment and all will be as it was before. How we shall laugh at the trouble of parting when we meet again. Thank you, Luca. Laura? Hello. I'm Laura. I'm a recovering addict. Um, Sponsee of Rachel's. Don't worry, the whole fellowship isn't going to share today. I think the last one. <laughs> Um, my husband and I, John, wrote something together. Um, we wrote a little poem together because um, we do that sometimes. And also because Rachel helped him become a better man. And she helped me become a better woman and a better wife and uh, helped our marriage, helps our marriage tremendously. Mama Rachel. Mama Rachel went home the day before it turned cold the day before the smell of wood smoke came in on a winter wind. We were not there years, years, years ago, but we know how it went. She told us, Christmas time in Miami, the heat, heat, heat of a bad day, maybe the worst day. Mama Rachel went home to no gifts, no tree, feeling down, down, down. She went home to a knock at the door, thinking, another damn bill. She opened the door, to love, to friends, to a pine tree. Sometimes home is closer than we know. Sometimes the only thing between us and change is a single soul's belief in us. We were there for a smile in the eyes that sprang from the heart. We were there for love unabridged, told flat out, work in transformative voodoo without permission. Love brought Rachel Christmas time in Miami the day she thought about giving up, the day she let in all the love, love, love she went and spread all over these mountains and all over us, right up until the day Mama Rachel went home. Thank you, Laura, and thank you all who shared uh, your sentiments that were expressed are shared by all of us, I can assure you. Um, we'll now welcome the nurse honor guard to present a nurse's farewell ceremony.
lamp of knowledge is the official symbol of the nursing profession. The illumination of light from the candle represents sanctity of life and symbolizes everything that Florence Nightingale stood for. Compassion, gentleness, kindness, courage, and an unwavering devotion to duty and higher education. Rachel's original lamp was lit in 1984 when she graduated from St. George's Community College in Largo, Maryland. She faithfully followed her calling and served the nursing profession. At this time, I ask all nurses in attendance to please rise and stand with the North Carolina Nurse Honor Guard as we present a Nightingale tribute in honor of your loved one, friend, and colleague. It is said, once a nurse, always a nurse. As knowledge once learned can never be forgotten. Nursing is a calling, a lifestyle, a way of living. Nurses here today honor our sister, Rachel Pagan, who is no longer with us in her life as a nurse. Ray is not remembered by her 38 years as a nurse, but by the difference she made during those years, by stepping into people's lives, by special moments. When a calming, quiet presence was all that was needed, Ray was there. In the excitement of the miracle of birth, or in the mystery and the loss of life, Ray was there. When a silent glance could uplift a patient, family member, or friend, Ray was there. All those times when the unexplainable needed to be explained, Ray was there. When the situation demanded a swift foot and a sharp mind, Ray was there. To educate, fellowship, and lead by her life's example, Ray was there. When a gentle touch, a firm push, or an encouraging word was needed, Ray was there. When someone needed to choose the best from a family's thank you box of chocolates, Ray was there. To witness humanity, its beauty, in good times and in bad, without judgment, Ray was there. To embrace the woes of the world willingly and offer hope, Ray was there. And now that it's time to be by the greater one's side, Ray is there. Rachel, we honor you this day and give you a white rose to symbolize our honor and appreciation for being our colleague. Thank you. You may now be seated. And now for the nurse's prayer.
Thank you, ladies. What a wonderful tribute. What else would Rachel have done for a living but be a nurse? For those of us who have had the misfortune of suffering the pains of age and sometimes accident, we know how invaluable a nurse can be when we're hurting, when we're sick, when we need hope, when we need comfort. And I commend those ladies and all who stood um, as nurses, as I do Rachel. It is a special person uh, that answers the call of being a nurse. I've uh, been asked to provide some closing remarks here tonight. And, uh, frankly, uh, I feel a little inept after all of that. Um, some of what was shared, I'll repeat. I'll add a little more. Renee, I ask for your grace and mercy. If the speaker sucks, remember Rachel's words. <laughs> it's the message, not the messenger. And the rest of you might benefit from that wisdom as well. <laughs> Rachel was truly a wonderful woman, daughter, sister, mother, aunt, grandmother, and friend. The many people gathered here this evening are a testament to that. When I was thinking and praying what the Lord would have me share with you all tonight, there were two words that immediately came to mind. And try as I did to seek the Lord and ask if there was something more, it seemed too easy that they would just come to me like that. He just kept repeating it over and over again in my spirit till my stubbornness yielded. Those words we've heard many times over tonight, love and hope. Love and hope shaped and informed every area of Rachel's life and made her the woman we all came to love and the woman that came to love us all. We celebrate Rachel today for among other things, and perhaps more than anything else, how well she modeled love and hope. I'd like to talk to you for a moment or two this evening about those two words. First love, and then hope. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. Paul writes to the church at Corinth a very familiar passage of scripture that I imagine many of us have heard and maybe some of us have even memorized. He described love this way. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. That's God's love for us. We don't deserve it, yet he lavishes it upon us. The scriptures say it this way in Romans 5, verse 8. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This ideal of love was perfectly modeled by Jesus. No one can ever love us more, and no one can ever love us better. Jesus has commanded that we love that same way. If we were honest, we all want to be loved that way. 
Yet all of us find it so difficult to love that way. I want to read a passage from 1 John verse, chapter 4, verses 7 through 19. I hope it will speak to us tonight. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on that day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Rachel understood the importance and impact of loving like Jesus. And Rachel aspired to love us all this way. As I meditated on these scriptures myself, preparing to speak tonight, the story of Lazarus was brought to mind. Perhaps another very familiar passage of scripture, and maybe one that most of us know. But I'd like to share a little bit of it with you tonight. For those of you who are familiar, Lazarus and his sisters, Martha and Mary, supported Jesus' ministry. They loved him, and he loved them. Whatever Jesus needed, they seemed to provide. They were always ready, willing, and able to help wherever they could with Jesus' ministry, whether that meant following him from town to town or welcoming him into their own town. But those of you who know the scripture and know of Jesus know that Jesus was never alone. He was followed always by at least 12 disciples and many times many multiples of that who formed the more expansive group of disciples and followers of Jesus and then the flocks of people that would follow all of them clamoring to hear his words, clamoring to feel his love, clamoring uh, for the wisdom and the insight that he provided that was unlike any other clamoring to be touched by the Son of God. And so it was often that when Jesus appeared in the town in which Lazarus, Mary, and Martha lived, that they would open their home, not only to Jesus, but to the many who followed him. And they would feed not only Jesus, but the many who would follow him. Does that remind us of anyone? Rachel not only opened her heart to us. She opened her home. She opened her life. She opened her family. And all of you gathered here today, I would, I would be surprised if any of you never enjoyed her cooking. Uh, she was such a marvelous host, such a loving and caring and compassionate person, such a generous person with who she was and all that she had. Such were Mary and Martha and Lazarus. So the news came to Jesus one day, in verse 3 of chapter 11 of the Gospel of John. 
Lord, the one you love is sick. The one that you love is sick. See, Jesus loved Lazarus the same way that he loved Rachel and loves her still. And she knows that better now than she ever has. Better now than we can know it. And better now than we will know until we, like her, are in his presence. He loved Lazarus. He loved Rachel. And he loves all of us. And he was concerned with the fact that Lazarus was sick. He told his disciples in verse 4, the sickness will not end in death. And he went on in verse 5, uh, it was noted that Jesus again loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. In verse 20, it says that Martha went to meet Jesus. In the darkest hour of her life, she knew where to go. She knew who would be the source of life and hope, of faith and peace and comfort, strength and even joy in that hour. She went to Jesus. Jesus told Martha in verse 23, your brother will rise again. Now listen to what Jesus said after that. He said in verse 25, I am the resurrection. I am the life. Those who believe in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And he asked Martha this question. He said, do you believe this? Well, I can tell you with no reservation, with all the certainty that I can muster, that Rachel believed that. That Rachel, from the day she professed and confessed her faith in Jesus Christ, she believed that. To the day she breathed her last breath at the Veterans Administration Hospital, she believed that. And more than ever before, she believes it now, standing in the presence of our Lord. Verse 27, Martha answers Jesus, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Verse 28 tells us that Martha then went to tell Mary, her sister, that Jesus was there. And hear this, he was asking for Mary. You know, Jesus lived on this earth little over 33 years. Three and a half of those years were devoted to his earthly ministry, the very purpose for which he was sent to this earth. He had a lot to do in those three and a half years. If you read the gospel, you'll see that he went from town to town to town to town to town, preaching, working miracles of all sorts from changing people's hearts, minds, and lives to raising them from the dead. Those three and a half years of his life were more busy, were more tumultuous, were more impactful than all the years in this room combined. Yet Jesus, in that moment, on his mission, was asking for Mary. Mary was important to Jesus. In verse 29, we read that upon hearing this from her sister Martha, Mary ran to Jesus. And the people who were gathered there to console her, believing that she was running to Lazarus's tomb to mourn, all ran after her to provide her whatever comfort they could. She wasn't going to the tomb. She was going to her Lord. When Jesus saw this in verse 33, it says that Jesus deeply moved, was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled by the weeping of Mary and others who had come to console her. And in verse 35, Jesus wept. It's okay for us to weep. It's an expression of our love Rachel. 
It's an expression of the great sense of loss that we feel by no longer having her physically present with us. No one understood that better than Jesus. And if Jesus could cry, we too can cry. It makes us more like him. I'm going to pass over a lot of the text from there until the end to share this with you. Jesus ends up at Lazarus's tomb. He says a prayer. And in verse 43, we're told that Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Now that alarmed some people because Lazarus had been dead for four days. He was in a sealed tomb in grave clothes, wrapped up in linen, embalmed as if he was a mummy. Jesus commanded that the stone be rolled away. And he said that in a loud voice. And in verse 44, we read that the dead man came out. And Jesus instructed that he be loosed of his grave clothes and let go. That may seem to some a peculiar thing to share at a celebration of life ceremony such as this. But I want to say this about that scripture. I've heard different theories about why Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Some have opined that if he hadn't named Lazarus himself, that all who were dead within the sound of his voice would have risen from their graves in that moment. I think it may have been something else. You see, it says, Jesus proclaimed in a loud voice, no doubt with all the authority in heaven and earth given to him by God as the Son of God, as the Messiah, he commanded Lazarus to come back. As great as the prospect of coming back may seem to us, I'm going to guess that it didn't seem so great to Lazarus. The Bible says that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. It's instantaneous. So the moment that Lazarus breathed his last breath, he beheld all the glory, all the beauty that heaven presented him. Of being in the presence of the Lord, of being in a place that God specifically and specially prepared for those who die in faith to his word. And so I imagine in that instance, had Jesus not summoned him with all the authority vested in the Son of God, that Lazarus might have said, no thanks. <laughs> no thanks. I've been there. I've done that. I know those folks. I love them. I'll wait for them here. I wonder... If our Lord saw fit to call Rachel back, if he'd have to call more than a few times. Because as much as Rachel loved all of us, as much as Rachel loved and celebrated life, man, I'm not sure that I know of a person who loved life more fully than Rachel Pagan, who celebrated people who celebrated experiences, who celebrated faith as much as Rachel did. And many of you mentioned that here tonight. I think the Lord probably have to, someone said, I think maybe the nurse's brigade about uh, when someone needed a swift kick to the behind. I think that's what it would require for Rachel to leave where she is now to join us again here.
Rachel loved the Lord. Her daughter spoke of it. Some of you spoke of it. She loved his word. She loved the person of Jesus. You know, the person that loves all. The Bible in John 3.16 that says that, that God gave his only son that whosoever believes on him shall not die but have everlasting life. That's not a statement of exclusion. It's a statement of inclusion. He paid the price for sin for all of us. He extended that invitation from this life to the next to spend eternity in a place that he's prepared for all of us, in a place where Rachel is now not just for a few, not just for some or most, but for all who accept the invitation. That's how Rachel loved, that freely, that generously. I want to share a little bit with you all about hope. Rachel radiated hope, hope for herself, hope for her children, hope for her extended family, hope for all of you. That's why she did what she did. If I heard correctly, she has over 200, uh, what's the correct term, forgive me, sponsorees? <laughs> Thank, that guy gave me a thumbs up right there, so I'm going for it. I won't repeat it, but I'm going with that. Um, Anyhow, that's why Rachel did what she did. She had unbelievable hope. And that hope was never seen more, I think, than in the courageous battle she fought against cancer. She beamed with hope. Against all odds, whatever the circumstance, however bad the pain was, however she suffered through the radiation and the chemotherapy, she radiated hope. I know you all saw it. She was hopeful to the very end. I pray that that be an example for us. It's hard to be here for all of us. We mourn the life the loss, rather, and celebrate the life of a wonderful, precious woman who shared so much with us. The Bible has something to say about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. It says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Rachel's not physically present with us any longer, but she's still very much alive, more alive than she's ever been. And she's celebrating life more than any of us could ever celebrate it, more than she even celebrated life here. She hopes to be reunited with all of us sometime soon when the Lord returns. On that day, 
Paul tells us in that passage of scripture that the Lord again will call out with a loud voice. And those who died before his return, like Rachel, will experience what Lazarus experienced in the passage of scripture I shared earlier. A new life, a resurrected life, one that's far better than the one we have now. Lastly, I want to give you all a glimpse of what Rachel's experiencing now. If you saw her in the hospital or in the waning days of her fight with cancer, what she experienced at the end of her life was very real. You saw it with your eyes. You held her hands and prayed for her. Um, you could hear it. You could experience it with all your senses. Well, Rachel now is experiencing something quite different with all of her senses, something that we cannot relate to just yet, but hopefully will one day. Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 through 7. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who has seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. That's what Rachel's experiencing right now. A place where she has the same access to God that I could have with any of you here. She is actually in his presence for all eternity, in a place where there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death, no more suffering, just love, peace, comfort, joy in the presence of our Lord forevermore. I want to share these last few verses with you in the next chapter of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 7. Jesus says to John the Apostle, who wrote the book of Revelation, I am coming soon. He repeated in verse 12, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give it to each person according to what they have done. And lastly, in verse 20, he reemphasizes, yes. I am coming soon. Jesus' return is imminent, and his reward for those who love, seek, and serve him is greater than anything we could think, ask, speak, or imagine. If Rachel could speak to us now, she would attest to that. This is the hope we have in Jesus. It's the hope that Rachel carried with her into eternity, and the hope, I pray, will fill our hearts until the day we join her in the Lord's presence forevermore. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Father, we thank you, first and foremost, for your presence in our lives. We thank you for the love, care, and concern you have for us. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, and the door that he opened with his death that we might be reconciled to you and promised eternity in heaven. Father, we thank you that your son Jesus touches us, ministers to us, and blesses us, even through other people, Lord. Rachel was such a person who had such a profound impact on everyone with whom she came into contact, Lord. She was a precious woman and a precious daughter to you, Lord. Father, you called her home early, but we know she's being rewarded richly 
for all that she did in your name and for all the people that she touched with your love, with your compassion, and with your care, Lord. Father, we pray, Lord, that we would be comforted by the knowledge that we someday will be joined in your presence with her and others that have gone before us, Father, to spend eternity in your presence, Lord. We know she awaits us, but you await us even more, Father. You long for the day that we might be reunited with you and spend eternity in your presence, Father. We pray, Lord, that we would run to you as Mary did for comfort, for hope, for strength, for peace, for joy, Lord. We pray that the memory of Rachel, Lord, and all that's been said about her today would remind us of how much she loved us, how much you love us, how much we enjoyed being with her. Father, and that when we mourn, when we grieve, we would not despair, we would not fall into hopelessness, Lord, but that we would remember that someday soon you're, rec you're returning with your reward in hand to make all things new. Father, we pray for Rachel's children, for the family, and for all gathered here today, that you would bless us as we go, that you would give us peace, Lord, with you and with one another, that you would fill our hearts with love, joy, and peace, Lord, that we would leave this place different than the way we came in, Lord, and we thank you that you made us different through the love and the time we shared with Rachel, Lord. We've been made better by it, and we pray that we never forget it, that we would honor and celebrate her life, and that we would honor and celebrate you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, I just want to say for those of you who might not have been aware, uh, at the bottom of the program, uh, there's a reception immediately following this service. The address is provided there, uh, and we hope to see you all there. Thank you again for coming. Be blessed. her family's not from Asheville, let them park in the parking lot at First Presbyterian, just so they're not confused about the parking situation. <laughs> <laughs> 